Well, good morning, Northland. Man, it is good to be with you. Happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there. Will you give it up for our dads one more time? I'm super grateful for my dad as I was crafting my little social media post this morning, like literally as I'm crafting it, just grateful for my dad, tears coming to my eyes, just super, super grateful for him. Well, we're in our TED series, which stands for Theological Educational Discourses, and this year we're looking at the church in a divided democracy. The way this format is, is I will have a part one, part two. Today, part one is really quick so I can get to part two. But I, I, I've kind of uh, at least surmised the three different camps that are out there for this series. There is one camp where you just cannot wait until this series is over. Doesn't mean anything to you. You know, like, so you're ready for it to be done. Uh, There's another camp where you just get mad every single week. And so you're just waiting for it to get done too. Or you've left and gone to a partisan church. Well, you're you're part of the problem. Anyways, uh, moving right on. (laughs) Or there's a third camp. Uh, that you, you really do appreciate the fact that we're wading into these messy waters and that we are navigating the messy middle and holding in tension what it means to be the people of God in the context and land that we live. And so I have heard from you. So, and I, I appreciate that encouragement. Well, so I, wanted to, I want you to take a poll, so you can, you can pull out your devices and pull out your smartphones, and I want you to take a poll, because I want to see where you are at, so just scan that QR code, or you can text the word polls to 97,000, and we're going to see how many of you are going to be voting this year. <laughs> so go ahead and take, take, take that quick poll. All right, you got about 15 seconds. If you haven't, if you haven't voted yet, go ahead and cast that vote. All right, let's see. Let's see the results. Uh, how are we doing? with the results. So will you vote in the 2024 presidential election? Some of you say no. Some of you say blank no. Uh, Some of you say yes. And then some of you say begrudgingly yes. Okay, awesome, awesome. And, And the reason why we wanted to conduct that poll is because this first part, we wanna talk about how do we leverage our earthly citizenship? Now, if you are a child of the king, if you are a believer, a Christian, all of those are synonymous. The Bible would teach that our primary citizenship and allegiance is to whom? God, God, heaven. All right, so that's our primary citizenship. But we do have earthly citizenship. And so the question is, as believers, how do we leverage our earthly citizenship for heavenly good? And so I just want to just give you a framework that you can actually see in the Apostle Paul's life of how we can look at our earthly citizenship and how we can leverage it for God's glory and others' good. So there are four ways that the Apostle Paul leveraged his earthly citizenship. The first way is that he used it, he leveraged it for justice. Now, we saw this at the end of the book of Acts. So he is under trial. His faith is under trial. They want to send him back to Jerusalem, but he knows that if he goes back to Jerusalem, he probably is going to be killed. He will not have a just trial. And so what does he do? He leverages his Roman citizenship and he appeals to Caesar. I want you to realize that it is very okay, it's very much okay for us as believers to leverage our earthly citizenship in the pursuit of justice. The second way that Paul leveraged his citizenship was for his well-being. 
This happened at least two times, but he's going to pull out his Roman citizenship card so that he would be protected. Now there were there were at least there was at least an instance uh, in Philippi where he chose not to pull it out early on, but then after he was released from jail, he then pulled it out. And so when it comes to us leveraging our earthly citizenship, uh, we need to be winsome and wise of how we leverage it for our good and our well-being. But if the apostle Paul will use his Roman citizenship for his well-being, we we can use our American citizenship or whatever citizenry we have for our well-being. The third way that Paul leveraged his citizenship was for God's mission. Now, this is a big one, particularly here in the U.S. Paul was a Roman citizen, so he was able to navigate the Roman Empire unobstructed. Today, we do, if you are an American, we have the privilege of living in America, a free society with religious liberty, and we need to make sure, as the people of God, we're leveraging our earthly citizenship for his glory as he wants us to advance his mission, which is redeeming a people from all peoples to reflect his glory in all spheres of life. So let me just ask you, how are you doing as an American citizen using your citizenry here in America to advance God's mission in the world. And then the fourth way that Paul leveraged his citizenship was for the common good and human flourishing. You see, the Bible speaks, and we'll look at this passage next week, but the Bible tells us as exiles living in a foreign land that we ought to seek the peace and the prosperity of the land in which God planted us. We see with the Apostle Paul, not only is he living for God's glory, he is living for others' good. He is seeking to love his neighbor as himself. And so what does it mean for us to leverage our citizenship for the common good and human flourishing? Well, there are many ways that we can do it, and we'll actually talk about some of those ways next week. But there's one way that I at least want to share with you right now, and that is actually through voting. That Paul did not have the right, and that's not the way it was set up, for him to cast his vote. But we definitely see that he leveraged his Roman citizenship in so many other ways. And therefore, I would actually conclude that if he's leveraging his earthly citizenship in those ways, then if he was an American today, this would be another way that Paul would leverage his earthly citizenship for heavenly good. And so while we by no means live in a perfect country, I do believe that we have the ability the ability that some other believers do not have in other parts of the world to actually cast a vote for whoever we would put in public office, whether it would be a local government, municipality, or our national scene. So here are six questions, and I wanna go through them really quick, but here are six questions that we, as the children of God, as believers, we can ask ourselves before we cast our vote. Number one, we could ask who will govern in a way that honors the nation's founding. Now, the reason why I put that up is because in both the Old Testament and New Testament, God never commands, nor does he task his, his people, his church, with changing the government in which they live. That is the reason why if we're going to embody a faithful presence, we need to have a rudimentary understanding of the government of the society in which we live. And I also want to just draw your attention to the fact that even our founders knew that it wasn't a perfect union, but they wanted to pursue a more perfect union. And so when you go to vote, well, those people uphold in some sense the founding documents and at least the spirit of those documents. Uh, here's what some authors of this book, Compassion and Conviction, here's what they write to Christians. If we, the church, are to be effective citizens who steward our citizenship well, we must raise our civic literacy. To engage politics effectively, Christians should be familiar with primary constitutional principle and relationship between the state and the church. Like church, we need to know the society, the culture, the government in which we live. 
The second question that we can ask is, who will govern in a way that will support the scripture's view of the good life? The good life means of human functionality and flourishing. And so here are just some of the principles of what the good life according to scripture looks like. So we need to be asking ourselves, will this person be moral? Uh, will this person pursue justice, equality, and equity among all people? Will they, will they pursue a civility? Will they pursue just laws and proper enforcement of those laws? Uh, will they maintain religious liberty? Uh, will they make sure they work for opportunity for people to advance in this world? Uh, will, they, will they hold to an access to education for all people? Uh, protection, support of the vulnerable and marginalized? And will they uphold personal responsibility? That there is personal responsibility that individuals need to have. So th th these are the principles of the good life according to the scriptures. The third question that we can ask is, who will be less of an obstacle to the church advancing her mission? Like we really do need to consider that. Because in a world where there are many countries that really do prohibit the church from advancing her mission, will we use our vote to those who would, who would be less of an obstacle for the church's mission? Here's what Thomas Jefferson is quoted as saying, I consider the government as prohibited by the Constitution from intermeddling with the religious institutions, their doctrines, discipline, or exercises. So when you vote for somebody, do they want to meddle in our affairs? Or will they leave us alone and allow us to do what God has put us here to do? Question number four. Who will see faith-based institutions as a partner in the flourishing of America? So not only are we asking the question, who will be less of an obstacle, but who will actually see us as a partner in the flourishing of America? Uh, listen to what President Bush and President Obama said about this. Here's what President Bush said in January of 2001. Faith-based and other community organizations are indispensable in meeting the needs of poor Americans in distressed neighborhoods. Government cannot be replaced by such organizations, but it can and should welcome them as partners. And like I said, this is not a right and left issue. This is an American issue. This is what President Obama said in 2009. But no matter how much money we, the government, invest or how sensibly we design our policies, the change that Americans are looking for will not come from government alone. There is a force for good greater than government. It is an expression of faith, this yearning to give back, this hungering for a purpose larger than our own that reveals itself not simply in places of worship. So both a Democratic president and a Republican president saw the need for faith-based institutions to bring about the flourishing of America. Question number five is how does the candidate view, garner, and wield power? This is where we're living in a day and age where there is a lot of abuses of power that are happening. Listen, power has been abused since Adam and Eve fell in the garden long ago. But just ask yourself, how do they wield? How do they achieve? How do they use power? Is it in an abusive way or is it for people's good? And then number six, the last question is, who will unite people rather than divide people? So those are six questions that we as Christians, as the church can ask before casting our vote. Now, we are a divided nation. That is pretty much clear. And we are in great need of healing. And this is a tall order for any politician today, especially in this new age of identity politics. And I realize that in answering these questions, no one politician is going to be perfect. In church, we should not expect them to be. We live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen nation. We live in a pluralistic society where many who run for political office do not share a Christian worldview nor embody a Christian witness with their life. 
And I don't expect that every Christian in answering these questions will conclude on supporting the same candidate. Nevertheless, I do believe Paul's framework, these questions give us this framework for how we as the people of God can live faithfully in a divided land and how we can leverage our earthly citizenship for heavenly good. So with that, will you pray with me and then we will go to part two where I'm about to preach the house down, all right? So Father, we do pray for our divided nation. It comes to no surprise to you that we are divided like we are, but I do pray that your church would be a balm, a healing agent to this land that we live in. I do pray that we would leverage our earthly citizenship for heavenly good, knowing that our primary allegiance is to you and you alone. While we work for the good, the peace, the shalom, the total flourishing of of the land in which you have planted us. So will you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to understand, and even hearts to receive how you want us to live as exiles in a foreign land. And will you give us just a, an example in Daniel 3 through these three men called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. For it's in your name we pray, our King. Amen. So if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn with me to Daniel chapter 3. We were in Daniel chapter 1 last week. Now, let me put up an image because if you've been here, you've seen at least a version of this image, but the Bible speaks of the kingdom of God. From Genesis all the way through Revelation, the Bible speaks of God's kingdom, and God has always wanted to bring his kingdom to earth, and we see that in the garden, Israel, Jesus, church, and new city. God has, he has always intended to bring heaven, to bring his kingdom to earth where his rule and reign would be projected throughout all of the earth. Now we see in the garden where God had created this perfect harmonious garden, created his image bearers, Adam and Eve, told them what they could do and told them what they couldn't do, that they couldn't eat from this one particular tree. But we know that Adam and Eve ate from that forbidden tree and God kicked them out of the garden. He kicked them out of his kingdom. He kicked them out of heaven. And therefore we have now the kingdom of man, which is now hell on earth. So in the Bible, you only have two kingdoms. You have the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. Now you've got to fast forward to really seeing the kingdom of man come together. And that is in Genesis 11. And so there we read that all of the people of the earth, they had been multiplying, but they had one language and they came together in this land called Shinar. And when they came together, they said, hey, let us make bricks and let's build an an incredible city for our own glory. And in that city, what they wanted to do, the center of that city was a tower. They wanted to build this tower or this temple. Scholars would say it actually was a ziggurat, which was a form of a temple. They wanted to build that temple into the heavens. They wanted it to be very tall, reaching to the heavens. Now, why did the civilization want to build this tower and reach it to the heavens so that they can make a name for themselves? You see, when God, the cosmic king, created us in his image, he wanted us to glorify him. That was the whole reason he wanted us to subdue the ground, to exercise dominion, to be fruitful and multiply so that we might glorify him. But in the kingdom of man, here's what's going to happen. They're going to use religion in building a temple and a tower to unite and advance the glory of man. So throughout history, the kingdom of man represented by the kingdoms of this world, Babel, Egypt, Canaanites, Assyrians, Babylon, Persians, Greeks, Romans, nation states, and look who I put down here. Everybody say that. America. Listen, America isn't the kingdom of God. And listen, you can get mad at me saying that, and you can be mad and wrong. But, but, but America is not part 
of the kingdom of God. America is part of the kingdom of man of how they use civil religion to unite and advance the glory of man. See, that's what they were doing. That's the spirit of Babylon. The spirit of Babylon is going to use civil religion to unite man for man's own glory. And just so that you know this idea of civil religion and faith, you've seen, you, you've seen a chart where I've given you the dimensions or the framework of faith, where faith is, oh, so let me, well, yeah, go here. So faith is the worldview, purpose in life, ethics for life religious or spiritual practices. So the spirit of Babylon is going to use religion to advance the glory of man. But throughout the Bible in both the Old Testament and New Testament, here's where God wants his people to live. He wants them to live in the world, but not. So we're gonna reflect God's kingdom in the kingdom of man. That, that's what we're going to do. And then that's why this whole idea of faithful presence comes into our framework, is that a faithful presence is going to have three dimensions to it. We're going to have a robust missiology, understanding what God's mission is, what his kingdom is, what does it mean to be exiles living in a foreign land, and understanding the role of suffering as we live in this foreign land. And then we're going to have a rough eschatology. We'll see how that plays a role in exile next week. And then we need a understanding of the government and the society in which we live so that we can be faithfully present to the Lord. You need to understand this to understand what is going on in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and as we look in Daniel chapter three. Here's the main point that I wanna flesh out with you this morning is that in exile, God's people will need a fiery faith of conviction as we face a fiery furnace of conformity. That's what we're gonna need. Because in every civilization under the kingdom of man, they will have this cultural pressure for everyone to conform to their civil religion. And so what I wanna do is I wanna give you a progression of the story in Daniel 3, and I wanna talk throughout of how what we see in Daniel 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego applied to us, the church, in the 21st century. So the first point of the progression of the story is the transition. So Babylon is in present day Iraq. So Nebuchadnezzar, he sent his army to Israel, to Jerusalem, to sack and to conquer Jerusalem. He does so, and then what does he do? He takes exiles back to Babylon. Now these exiles that he deports back to Babylon, uh, they are teenagers. They're somewhere between the ages of 13, maybe 17, 18, 19 years of age. And these Jewish teenagers are coming from the families of the nobles and the royal family. That's the first wave. Now, why is he doing that? Because he wants them to become good Jewish Babylonians. So if he can haul the, the cultural elites of Jerusalem, if he can haul them to Babylon and get them to think and believe and behave like Babylonians, then he would ultimately conquer all of the peoples around him. So he's gonna haul them off. And could you imagine, could you imagine being one of those Jewish exiles, those, one of those teenagers? that now you're living in a foreign land, Babylon. You have these foreign gods that you have never heard of. You've never heard of Nabu. You've never heard of Shamash. You've never heard of Nana. You've never heard of Asher. You've never heard of Marduk. You've never heard of Anu. Like you have not heard of any of these gods. You came from a monotheistic society, even though you are familiar with polytheism, but you were, you were a monotheist. You, you, you were to worship one God. Now you find yourself in this foreign land who really does embody polytheism where they worship all of these gods, the gods of Babylon. But not only that, there are different laws in this land. There are different ethics in this land. There are even different purposes in the nation Babylon. But yet in the book of Daniel, we see a handful of young men 
who embody a faithful presence. They're going to be in Babylon, but they're not going to be of Babylon. And just, I mean, just imagine, we, 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 we know of four, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were faithfully present to the Lord, living in Babylon, and they are going to change the face of a nation. Church, I'm gonna tell you that we, we need this word more than we ever have before, that we do not need to capitulate to this, the spirit of America, Babylon, but that we need to maintain our distinctiveness as the people of God and let God miraculously work through our faithfulness. So how does this work there, Pastor Josh, in the good U.S. of A? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that you asked. You've seen this image. So when America was founded about 250 years ago, it was founded with Judeo-Christian values and Enlightenment values held in tension. That's why I, I, I put our three systems of government right there. They held them in tension. But you need to come in for this. You need to elbow your neighbor and say, you need to listen. So our worldview, when we were founded, our worldview was based upon the Bible. We believed in a creator who endowed human beings with dignity and rights. We also believed that humanity was highly intelligent, at the same time, highly sinful, and that we needed to protect ourselves from ourselves, which is why we have the checks and balances there. But don't miss this. America used the God of the Bible for American glory. Just like we saw with the spirit of Babylon, we, we invoked and we still do many times invoke the name of God to appease God, not please him, so that Americans can pursue American glory like life, liberty, and happiness. And that is the reason why the church has at least felt like they had home-filled advantage. But I want you to realize it was basically like the Florida Gators playing the Georgia Bulldogs in Jacksonville. It wasn't home-filled advantage, although it felt like it. But like I have been saying, we have had this shift in American culture in the last 50 plus years. And the shift is no longer the tension of Judeo-Christian values. Now the shift is a secular enlightenment value mindset. And many people would refer to this kind of mindset as postmodernism. And here's what postmodernism teaches, that there is no grand story to life. There is no meta narrative in which to, em to embed your life and the life of the nation. Even Babylon, please hear me, even Babylon in Daniel had a meta narrative. They had all of these gods and all of these bigger stories in which to understand their micro story as the nation state of Babylon. But postmodernism, we don't have a grand story. We we reject, postmodernism rejects absolute truth. They are ruggedly individualistic. They're more about the individual than they are the corporate body. They're highly skeptical of institutions and authority. They're spiritually hungry. But here's the big, big point that I want you to see is that in postmodernism, humans become the gods. See, throughout the history of civilization, what you have mainly is that these nation states and their civil religion had a pantheon of gods that they would appease so that they could pursue their glory. But what we see now in the 21st century in America is postmodernism where the human beings become the gods that they're trying to satisfy, that they're trying to appease while pursuing their own glory. And so in this worldview, there are no gods or God. Human beings have become them. And this is the transition that we are in in our country. And I'm gonna do a call back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you a principle that I shared with you two years ago about transitions. In every transition, there is a transformation. You either transform more into the image of Adam or more into the image of Jesus. And I'll just be honest. When there was a transition, when America was founded, there are a lot of people who in some sense followed Jesus, but they fell victim to the spirit of Babylon in America. And now we, we're having the same thing, is that the, now the spirit of Babylon, they have just shifted the God that, or the gods that they call on, 
And now in this transition, we're either going to be transitioned more and transformed more into the image of Adam or Jesus. I'm going to tell you, you don't, you don't have another choice. You're either going to be transformed more into the image of the kingdom of man, Adam, or you're going to be transformed more into the image of Jesus, the kingdom of God. That's the only choices that you have. And I'm going to tell you, I'm just being as flat honest as I possibly can. The church has failed miserably in being transformed more into the image of Jesus and embodying the kingdom of God. And this transformation will always, this transformation in the transition will come by way of tests. Now, last week we saw the test of food and Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego said, no, we will not capitulate and we will not eat the food of Babylon. Here the test will be cultural conformity and bowing to an image. So well, we read this in Daniel three. So King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and six cubits wide. So 90 feet, think about the Washington Monument. And he set it up on the plain of Dura. What's interesting about the plain of Dura is that it's the same plain that we see in Genesis 11. So the land of Shinar is in the plain of Dura. So he's going to erect this image in the same location that Genesis 11 erected the Tower of Babel. So he then summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the other provinces provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. This is interesting. He's inviting all of the cultural elites of Babylon. He's inviting all, the, all, all of these different spheres of, of leaders to now this dedication ceremony to this golden image. And then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the music, and what we're going to do in July is we're going to look at the uh, uh, new albums, but same humanity. We're gonna look at some music because here's what I want you to realize is that in the mainstream culture, there will be music that is touting the ideology of that culture. So here's what we got. We got when you hear the music of Babylon, this is when you are going to fall down. And you're gonna fall down and you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown where? Into the blazing furnace. So here's the test, is that will you assimilate and capitulate to the civil religion of Babylon? Because here's what you have. You have Nebuchadnezzar saying, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna build a statue of gold. And this statue of gold is going to unite the nation religiously and politically. So this statue of gold is going to represent all of the gods in a, in a tip of the hat in an appeasement to the gods, thanking them for allowing them victory so that they can pursue the glory of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. And everyone, including the exiles, is expected to conform and bow down and to ascribe ultimate worth to the gods of Babylon, ultimate worth to the glory of Babylon and to Nebuchadnezzar. So the Jewish exiles, they are there. And again, hundreds of them, but yet there are three, because we don't know where Daniel is, but there are three that while all of this is taking place, they're like, we will not fail the test of faithfulness to our God. Let me ask you, are we, are you failing the test of cultural conformity in the spirit of Babylon here in America? Well, what does that look like? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Because the test of Christians living in America, we are told to get in line and conform in the following ways that we need to bow down to the God of government. And just so that you know, this is both a left and right issue because we are told that we need to believe that government can solve all of society's and individual problems. Every election cycle, politicians promise that if they get elected, they will solve all of the ills that plague our nation and our citizenry. 
They promise to do this or that, to create this program or that program, to reverse the program of the previous regime. And each party will demonize the other and tell people, if you aren't for me, my policies and my political party, then you are un-American. But the church, we will not capitulate to the God of government. We will not capitulate to the God of unbridled sexuality and individuality and self-identity. We will not capitulate and bow down to the God of greed and power. We will not bow down to the God of sports, where sports in some sense becomes preeminent in the American family. We will not bow down to the God of relativism, where that God says there is no truth. You are your own truth. Because here's what our... Society would tell us that if we don't conform and fall in line, then you will succumb to the God of censorship. We'll just censor you. That's the test. And here's what I want you to realize about cultural conformity. The pressures of cultural conformity test the sincerity and strength of one's faith. That's the reason why the church has been tested in America and has been found wanting because we don't have the faith that the Bible, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. Because we have become more like the spirit of Babylon, capitulating to civil religion rather than a relationship with our ultimate king. And here's the principle. To toe the line of the culture is to be out of line with Jesus. I don't know how, how, how strong I can say it. But if we capitulate as the people of God in towing the line of culture, we will be out of line with Jesus. If you want to tow the party line, if you want to tow a Republican line, you will find yourself out of step with Jesus. If you tow a Democratic line, you will be out of step with Jesus. And as his people, we are called to be in line with him and out of line with the culture. But I don't want you to miss this church. Because Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will work for the common good of an idolatrous culture, but they will not bow down to the idols of the culture. See, see, they're standing up. They're not condemning. They're not criticizing. They're not shaking their, their finger or their fist at the Babylonians. They're silently standing in protest because their allegiance is to another king and kingdom but they're working for the common good. They're just not bowing down to the idols of the culture. They passed the test, which leads to the third point in the story is their trial. Because if we pass the test of faithfulness, there will always be a fiery trial with God's people. And so here's the trial and the trial is going to take two sides. One, there will be a judicial side of a trial where our faith will be on trial. And then when they find that we are ultimately faithful to the cosmic king and not the powers that be, then there will be a fiery suffering trial. And here's what we see. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they replied to King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves because they stood. Then they had some people that tattled on them and went to Nebuchadnezzar and said, hey, your Jewish boys, they ain't bowing down to your idol that you made. Well, it really ticked Nebuchadnezzar off. And so he said, hey, guys, I'm going to give you one more chance. I really like you. You, 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 some, wise, you some wise suckers. So let, let, let me give you one more chance. They still don't bow down. And so they say to Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to. This is the most powerful man on planet Earth at the time. We don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us. Where would they even get that idea? Well, because the God that they serve, he has been in the delivering business. He delivered Joseph from the pit, put him in the palace. He delivered the Israelites from the superpower of the Egyptians. He had delivered Israel as they went into Canaan to possess the land. He had delivered David from the mouth of a lion, from the mouth of a bear, and the hand of a giant called Goliath. He had delivered Elijah from the prophets of Baal. 
I mean, so they know that God is able to deliver. And then they go on to say this, but even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. This is amazing. These young teenagers, these young teenage whippersnappers. Think about it. Nebuchadnezzar is giving them a way of salvation. He's saying, if you conform, there will be comfort and ease. That will be your salvation in Babylon. If you will just unite around the civil religion. But they said, nope. Because we got a relationship with the king of glory. We know him. We know what he's capable of. We know that he can deliver us. But even if he chooses not to, we still will worship him. He's the one who saves, not you. So here's the principle that they teach us. We worship God based upon who he is rather than what he does. Do you really believe that? Because as Americans, we are taught that God needs to do something for us before we worship him. God didn't come through. God didn't answer my prayer. God didn't allow me to make my house payment. Oh, God didn't heal my dad. God didn't heal my child. So I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to worship him now. But here's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego teach us is that they're going to worship God for who he is rather than what he does. You see, the spirit of Babylon going to worship the gods based upon what they do or don't do because they got to appease them so that they can pursue their glory. But what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego teach us is that we're not appeasing God. No, we're giving him our ultimate allegiance for who he is. And so you talk about confidence, talk about assurance, talk about joy in God, even in the face of trial. Hey, church, will we hold on to our faith in this trial? through this trial? Will we maintain our distinctiveness as the people of God? Will we stay on mission as the people of God? Will we embrace this trial that we have entered into in this cultural moment, a trial of contempt and derision and marginalization, mockery and scorn, insult and vilification, one of disrespect and ridicule because that's how the mainstream culture sees us. Or will we, church, will we feel the need to defend ourselves, to go on the offense and fight fire with fire? Because if we choose this way, we are bound to lose because God's people do not fight fiery furnaces with fiery furnaces. We fight fiery furnaces with fiery faith. We fight with a towel, not a sword. Because we believe that God, if he chooses, can deliver us from the fire. And then that leads to the testimony. So we got transition test, trial testimony. So Nebuchadnezzar, he's hot, and he has the strongest men of Babylon toss Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. As his strongest men of Babylon toss them into the fire, they die. But here's what we read then, King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, hey, weren't there three? Three men that we, we tied up and threw into the fire? Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of the gods. <clears throat> Testimony. <laughs> Testimony is that you are giving witness to what you have seen. But I want you to know that the testimony is coming from Nebuchadnezzar of what he has seen. <laughs> he can't believe his eyes. Those suckers are walking around in the fire. <laughs> having the time of their life. Could you imagine what that conversation was like when Jesus showed up? We don't know. I mean, we can speculate. Good job, guys. Wow. 
man, proud of your faithfulness. Way to stand. <laughs> you see old Nebby out there? See how big his eyes are? <laughs> Let me tell you. Uh, because God was in Babylon all the time. He had not left his exiles alone. But the faithfulness of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego called and beckoned their king to be with them in the fire. Let me ask you this, are you and I, are we living in such a way as to beckon the presence of Jesus to be with us in our fire? Because he doesn't show up for unfaithfulness. He shows up in faithfulness, in supernatural, powerful ways. And so my question is our actions, is our actions given witness to the life and the presence of Jesus in the world? Which leads to the last is this, triumph. The Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. Like I'm like, the reason why there's an exclamation mark is because Nebuchadnezzar is emphatically saying it. Like he rescued you, still not over it. And they trusted in him and defied the king's commands and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Let me, let me, church. Are you willing? I mean, again, this is, the, this is the hard call of our faith. Are you willing to give up your life for Jesus? Like, are you, like, I'm talking about, would you give up your American citizenship? Would you give up prosperity? Would you give up your house? Would you give up your car? Would you give up your job? Would you give up your 401k? Would you give up your life for the sake of Christ? Because Nebuchadnezzar is wild by these teenage boys that they would be willing to give up their life for the sake of this God. Because you're not gonna give up your life in the pursuit of appeasing a God, but you would give up your life in the pursuit of acknowledging the superiority of that God. Um. So Nebuchadnezzar, this is, this is amazing. He praises their faithfulness. He praises their courage. So here's the triumph. Is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they won respect of the king rather than wanting revenge on the king. They won the respect rather than wishing for revolution. <laughs> and did you notice that Nebuchadnezzar makes room for their faith? Now, Nebuchadnezzar does not convert here. He is not telling the Babylonians to convert to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but he is telling Babylon, make room for the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Make room for their faith. Could you imagine what that would look like here in America? Our triumph isn't converting a pagan nation, but making a pagan nation open to making room for a distinct and subversive faith. Because here's the principle. Fiery faith always overcomes the fiery furnaces. I could put up Genesis 11 and all of the nations that have come and gone. <laughs> but there's one God who has the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. The fiery faith always overcomes the fiery furnaces. The towel defeats the sword. And church, that is the era that we are entering in. That is the season we are in. 
Will we embody the fiery faith of the conviction that Jesus is the supreme king, the cosmic king, that he is one day going to bring in full the kingdom of God? If we believe that, we can be faithful in the midst of fiery furnaces of conformity. Let's pray. Father, we need you. Oh, we need you. Every hour, we need you. And our one request is your righteousness, Spirit. We, we pray that you would invade our hearts. Give us the power to embody this faith. To trust in the cosmic king, even in the midst of these tests and trials. Because we're going through them. But may we take courage from young teenagers like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were embodying this faith way before the cross of Christ and his resurrection. That we have even more reason to stand firm and strong. And may you use this church's faithfulness to completely transform the face of a county, counties, a region, a state, possibly even a nation. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Marsh, will you lead us?